So I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about terrorism, surprisingly. Uh, but the general overview for my talk is uh, I'm going to speak quite a bit to set up the background and context for this sort of work. I'm um, talking about structure, content, epistemological quandaries, and questions like who is a terrorist or who are terrorists. Um, I'm also, like I said, going to talk some about the philosophical role or scientific role that quantitative studies can play in terrorism research. Uh, and finally, I'll show you some results from some of my research that I've done. So, what is terrorism? Uh, Andrew Silke, um, who's a researcher out of the UK, has written a lot about terrorism, likes to use the parable of the three blind men in the element to explain what the problems are around talking about terrorism. And if you know the parable, or if not, we'll briefly revise this. Uh, it essentially says there's three blind men that chance upon an elephant one day, and they all try and figure out what kind of creature this is. So one man grabs a hold of the tail and decides these are thin, reedy people with whip-like features. Uh, and another one grabs the trunk and says, no, they're huge, writhing, serpent-like creatures with tentacles. And another one grabs a leg and describes, no, they're more like tree trunks that just sit there. They're huge and immobile. Um, and that's really, uh, like I said, the defining characteristic of terrorism studies, one of the defining characteristics is that there's a lack of a definition for terrorism. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, I really actually like these quotes that were found for me uh, from Louis, Louis Richardson. It points out that uh, really the only thing we can all agree on is that terrorism is a bad word. She also goes on to point that the problem is also that if you can immediately label someone as a terrorist, you've gone a long way to winning your argument. We can call this a corollary to Goodwin's law, if you will. So, what is terrorism? Most people would recognize this image, even if you're too young to remember it, as from the 1976 Munich Olympics, when several members of the Israeli team were taken hostage and later killed by Palestinian terrorists. Some people might recognize this image, too. Uh, this was from Charleston, Virginia in 2017, when young man drove his car through a crowd of protesters and ended up killing one of them. Interestingly enough, this is terrorism. This was prosecuted as a hate crime, not as terrorism. Uh, superficially, they're both quite similar, we think. And the difference between the two is actually quite debatable. <coughs> the problem with terrorism and trying to study it is that, as Louise Richardson point out, it's a pejorative term. So the minute we say the word terrorism, we bring an emotional perspective into trying to identify and classify events. And much of this, like we said, is not only emotional, it's subjective, and it's based on personal experience or beliefs. So terrorism is not a new phenomenon. Uh, dating back to the Sakari zealots, in the first century AD, who used political assassination to attempt to push the Romans out of Judea. In the 11th century, uh, the al Hashanians, or as they're later known, the assassins, uh, <coughs> I'm gonna try to figure out where to stand, not to buzz. Um, fought against Sunni authorities in Persia and Syria in the 11th century. More recently, the gunpowder plot, which is a celebrated holiday in England now, was a wonderful example of one of the first cases of non-state terrorism was an attempt to blow up the parliament. And more recently, things like the Missouri-Kansas border wars before the Civil War, the Ku Klux Klan in the US after the Civil War were sought to intimidate newly enfranchised African-American voters from exercising their franchise. The Fidian bombing campaigns in Ireland, in the 19th century, and much of the political instability of the late 19th century in Europe, which led to sort of the start of the anarchist movement. To this fine, young, upstanding citizen 
Leon Sholgosh, who in 1901 assassinated President McKinley. A couple of interesting things about him. Uh, he had a crazy foreign sounding name, Sholgosh, that I actually had to spend about 10 minutes this afternoon learning how to pronounce. And it was this assassination of McKinley that kicked off a wave of anti-immigrant and anti-foreigner uh, sentiment, fear of invading hordes of migrants, bringing their violence with them. Unfortunately, he was a native-born American citizen from Ohio, I believe. So things aren't always what they appear. What this all brings us back to this question, what is terrorism? If we know it and we see it, surely we ought to be able to define it. But all kinds of questions arise when you start to do this, such as, is, this a pro is, is terrorism a process? Is it a phenomena? Is it a tactic? Um, how does it fit into a broader scheme of political violence? All the way from insurgency and civil war, uh, to the use of assassinations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, is terrorism a crime? Should we treat terrorism a crime as a crime, or should we treat terrorism as a military problem? Is there such a thing as legitimate terrorism? And finally, one of the questions that's important is if we're going to have a definition, how do we constrain that definition so it retains meaning and isn't just stretched to the point where it's applied to anything we don't like? which is in real danger of doing. Um, and like I said, one of the other questions that arise in this is, is questions of, can we thus then identify necessary and sufficient conditions for terrorism? And some of the things that have been suggested have been looking at ideology and motives, uh, tactics, strategy, and operational behavior, um, who the targets are, who the perpetrators are. And all of these things are pretty interesting to think about. And one of the problems that I always have coming back to thinking about terrorism, especially terrorism versus crime, is crime is typically well, well defined as a set of behaviors that are outlawed by the state. One of the elements that crops up continually when you talk about terrorism is the notion of motive and intent. And that is the idea of it is violence or the threat of violence used to coerce uh, and advance a particular political agenda. The problem with that is it's very difficult to look at acts and things that happen and, and attribute intent and meaning to them factually. Um, it's easy to do emotionally usually, but it's difficult to do factually. So it's difficult to think about terrorism as being violence with a certain kind of motive. And when you get in that motive, it becomes subjective, and that's when it becomes especially difficult to define. So, who is a terrorist? And here's some lovely, happy young people enjoying a day's outing who are actually members of the Bader Meinhof group. I think it was this first generation Bader Meinhof. That was a left wing terrorist group, also known as the Red Army Faction, that was active in Europe and Germany. Um, from about 1970, I think, to 1998 was the last sort of attributed action to them. But they look like nice kids, I think. Um, here's another lovely picture. So we get into this idea of talking about profiling. If we want to identify individuals, the uh, first thing that always comes out of everyone's mouth is let's get, let's get a profile of what a terrorist is. Um, here's a really nice picture, oddly enough, of the actor Stephen Ray's wife in her younger days. Um, Dolores Price and her sister Marion, who, like I said, Dolores later went on to marry Stephen Ray, have some lovely children, and was well known and accepted in Irish society. In the 70s, she was an IRA bomber. So people don't always look like it. And so the questions around profiling uh, center on things like psychological factors. Is there a, a, a psychology of terrorism? Is there a psychological profile we can use? Are there cultural demographic factors that can affect? And finally, the third thing is they want to look at sort of behavioral patterns. Can we look at behavioral trajectories and identify people who are terrorists? So it's actually a very natural human reaction to look at behavior that we can't comprehend and say, well, that's just crazy. 
The problem is, crazy doesn't really mean anything. Most terrorists, or I should say terrorism, is not a mental illness. The observation that terrorists and psychopaths have a lot of characters in common are based on post facto analysis of what they did. Well, they must have been a psychopath because they did this. There's no indication prior to that that they necessarily exhibited psychopathic behavior or traits. Most characters, like I said, most terrorists in general do not qualify as mentally ill or insane. Note that insanity is a legal term, not a medical term, referring to culpability under the law. If you are insane, it means you do not understand the repercussions of your actions and therefore are unable to assist in your defense legally and are not responsible for them. Um, Bruce Hoffman, who's a really very, very well-known American scholar of terrorism, has a great quote where he talks about every terrorist he interviewed, he was always struck by how calm and rational they were. They were just very ordinary people who typically had been driven to some course of action, oftentimes after a lot of very careful thought and consideration. And we actually know for a fact that both the IRA and Al-Qaeda actively takes measures to exclude people with mental health problems from their organizations. Um, and finally, one of the problems with this is violent radicalization is incredibly poorly understood. Uh, the comment I heard at a conference a few years ago was there were now as many models for radicalization or more, rad more models for radicalization than there were people who had ever been identified as violent radicals. And that's largely true. So we also think we might want to look at cultural or demographic or ethnic groups or physical characteristics of people who might be terrorists. And again, I have a picture of a couple of really nice young guys. Uh, the man on the left was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Um, the kid on the right was a decorated army soldier. Um, the guy on the left, he and his brother set a bomb off at the uh, Boston Marathon. And the guy on the left was Timothy McVeigh, who blew up a federal building in Oklahoma City that prior to 9-11 was the worst, deadliest terrorist attack on American soil. They looked like nice guys. They're just average guys, right? One of the problems with looking for profiles and looking for characteristics to identify people as being terrorists uh, is that none of these factors are particularly good. In fact, they tend to, and we're going to talk about this in more detail in a little bit, these approaches tend to be counterproductive. Um, classic case here is, is if you look at this gentleman on the left and gentleman on the right. They're pretty similar looking guys. The guy on the left's name is Richard Jewell, and he was working as a part-time security guard for the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. And in the course of his work, he came across a backpack that was all by itself in the middle of a square, I think it was, or something like that. And he opened it up and discovered that there was a bomb inside. And he was initially hailed as a hero for finding this bomb and presenting this terrible terrorist attack. But I believe there was an eyewitness, an eyewitness of who left the backpack there. And unfortunately, it was an eyewitness description of the guy on the right who looks an awful lot like the guy on the left. So poor Richard Jewell was accused of planting the bomb himself and then finding it to make himself a hero. And he was pilloried in the press. And it wasn't for several, several months later that they actually caught the guy who uh, I believe was a right-wing anti-abortion activist who was hiding in a cabin up in the woods somewhere um, and was eventually arrested and tried. So. You know, looking at things like that can be very difficult. Looking for behaviors that identify terrorists are very, very difficult. Uh, there's lots of behavioral clues that uh, basically normal people do. Okay? Um, there's also not a good understanding of what suspicious behavior looks like when we talk about terrorism. And there is definitely the role that human fallibility plays into it. And like I said, the risk of mis misidentification can be particularly inconvenient for you. Or in the case of a young man named Charles de Menez, who was a resident of London after the July 7th bombing attacks in 2005, 
he was at tube station wearing his bulky jacket and he was jumping turnstiles and MI5 or MI6 maybe not I'm not sure who it was the Met who it was thought that he had a obviously had some kind of bomb on him because he had this big bulky jacket and he was trying to run away from the police he was trying to run away from the police because he didn't pay his fare um, he was shot and killed and actually all the officers uh, involved in that shooting were cleared of any wrongdoing which is still unfortunate so this idea of profiling that we have where we want to be able to identify people who are a threat to us as looking different acting different or being from a different place is really kind of ingrained in our human nature um, it's it's an idea that comes back again and again when people talk about terrorism is we, there has to be a profile we have to find the profile and it's very difficult to accept that there is no real profile and it's very difficult to establish one so where does it leave us because I've just spent about 15 minutes telling you how impossibly difficult it is to study terrorism and do anything about it well it leaves us in a state where there were two papers I think one might be a book actually that were written sort of reviewing the state of affairs in terrorism studies uh, one was written in 1988 and and uh, by Schmidt and Youngman um, and Andrew Silkey followed this up in 2001 and he sort of said that basically what was going on in the field of terrorism studies was about 20 percent of the articles actually had new content in them most researchers were just using easily, if they were doing any kind of quantitative research at all, they were using pretty easily accessible sources of data. And they were doing what a social scientist would call pre-experimental data analysis. What we as mathematicians or statisticians would call exploratory data analysis. They were simply looking at the data. There is a dearth of inferential analyses or analyses that are done using statistical methods that are meant to sort of scientifically find results and test theories. So the 20% number doesn't worry me because I suspect that's probably true in a lot of other fields. Um, but this lack of inferential analysis and this sort of stalled point where they are of just doing sort of exploratory data analysis after exploratory data analysis and not really discovering anything other than they can make pictures um, that's a bit worrying. So you would think the field would be ripe for quantitative specialists to get involved. Um, quantitative specialists know how to analyze data. We understand the process of statistical inference. We understand the process of scientific reasoning. Um, but there's a fundamental problem in trying to go work in a, in a qualitative field like terrorism studies or political science or sometimes social social sciences etc there is especially in terrorism studies there's a fundamental difference in the way that research is done by those two groups and it is a deeply seated fundamental distinction between how knowledge is created and how they believe knowledge is created and what it means to know something um, it makes it very difficult to work with qualitative researchers because they will quite literally speak another language. Um, comments like, and, and I know this from my own training, we were always sort of trained to look down on people who did social sciences and stuff because they didn't really do science. Um, and so there's this sort of criticism that, that falls them that they're too metaphysical, they just sort of argue points, they don't actually have any evidence or data, they never really can prove anything because they're just arguing about stuff. On the other hand, I think the criticism that comes the other way is that quantitative scientists are too reductionist. They're too much of positives and they're reductionists and they break the world down into such a simple model and they have such general results from their analyses that they can't say anything meaningful about anything that they analyze really. And Essentially, this picture illustrates it quite well. On the left, you have the PhD students in math in a neatly ordered environment, dutifully plugging away at their computers, writing their theses, and doing analyses. 
And on the left, you have what I believe, I've never seen this, a couple of grad students in the social sciences. And you can see they've sort of got papers littered about and they're staring off in the space thinking and smoking something. And they've got the requisite Che Guevara poster. Um, and so this is the stereotype, right? And so that's one of the things that makes it very difficult for these people to work together. So um, looking at this, I've got a couple examples of some, some problems that I've worked on and some, some research that I've worked on. I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll make a short case for statistics. All right, so statistics, a lot of it is based on the concept of summarizing large amounts of data uh, and modeling them as essentially probabilistic models and then using data to fit them to make statistical models and estimate parameters of this theoretical model and then make inference on that and then by that be able to extend that inference to real world phenomena that are modeled as a probabilistic model. Um, this is a pretty well developed science and one of the nice things about it is the mathematical sciences and statistics have gotten very good at understanding what numbers are telling you when you have a lot of numbers describing a process. So I'm going to show an example I like to call profiling doesn't work. Um, and this was based on a project I did with researchers at Georgia State University, including John Horgan. Uh, it was looking at the role that conversion to Islam played in the radicalization process. Prior to the start of the study, there were uh, several pieces written where people had noticed that someone who had committed some violent act of terrorism has, was a recent convert to Islam. And uh, lots of hand-wringing and concern that maybe this was an important risk factor we should be looking at. And we should really be looking into this because this was, this was going to put the nail in the coffin and help us find the bad guys. So as part of this project, uh, a lot of data was collected on the number of converts and the size of the Muslim population for several different countries, including the United States. In addition, there was uh, a small database of cases for converts uh, who'd been convicted of, of oh, uh, either terrorism or terrorism support acts and had been radicalized in that sense. Um, and we also collected um, a lot of people's personal narratives about their conversion experience. So the first thing is, this is the table for the United States. Now, I, I will not swear that this is 100% accurate data, but it's pretty good, OK? Um, and it sort of comes up with a rather interesting statistic we see here. 40% uh, of all the terrorists that were convicted in the US were recent converts to Islam. In the greater Muslim population as a whole, only about 20% were converts. So if we look at this graphically in what's called a mosaic plot, wow, those proportions really look different. There sure seems to be something going on here. So if we sit down, we compute these probabilities, and I'll put these in sort of a formalized structure. We say the probability that someone is a convert given that they're a terrorist is about 40%. The probability that someone is a convert given that they're Muslim is about 20%, okay, or 0.2. <coughs> so this, at first glance, seems like there ought to be some very probative predictive ability in knowing that someone is a convert. But there's a bit of a logical flaw in all of this, several I'll say. Because it's a case where we look at something after the fact and then push it backwards to be a cause of what came before it. And in Latin, it's referred to as the logical fallacy of post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means just because something happens after something else doesn't mean the first thing caused it. And plus, these probabilities aren't particularly interesting, right? In the first case, knowing the probability that you're a convert, given that you're a terrorist, doesn't really concern me because I already know you're a terrorist. Okay, that's not what I want to know. What we're really interested in is the predictive capability of knowing whether or not someone was a convert. So let's look at the data again. 
Here's another mosaic plot of the data, but now I've let the width of the bins actually reflect the total number of samples. So as you can see, out of 2 million or so Muslims, only about I think 195 were identified as being terrorists. So already right away, what comes to mind is we're trying to predict a very rare phenomenon. Okay, so here's what we find out. If we do the calculations, and I'm not even resorting to using Bayes' theorem yet, we see that the probability that someone is a terrorist given they're a convert is on the order of about 1 in 10,000. The probability that you're a terrorist given that you're a non-convert is on the order of about 1 in 100,000. And the overall marginal probability that you are a terrorist is, again, on the order of about 1 in 100,000. So while it is true that in the U.S., if you are a recent convert to Islam, you are two and a half times more likely to be a terrorist. In the U.K., that number is higher. In the rest of the EU, that number is higher. We have to consider what it's two and a half times of. Okay. Um, if it's two and a half times something that is about one in a hundred thousand, that's not a good betting proposition. Okay. Um, and then we're going to go in a little bit more detail about number one, why this is the case. But first of all, we're going to talk about why this is a bad idea. So we talk about the idea of risk. Okay. And risk is defined in an actuarial or an engineering sense as the probability of an event times the cost of that event. So we think about risk associated with huge natural weather disasters. If it's a really rare event, even if it's going to be a costly disaster, we don't necessarily consider the risk as being that bad compared to, say, something that happens much more frequently, but maybe isn't as costly. So we can look at this in the context of if I have some risk factor for predicting whether or not someone is a terrorist, I can say I've got I've got two options for my, my behavior. I can do something or I can do nothing. And the two true states of nature is that there really is a risk or it's not a risk. Okay? And so <clears throat> if there's no risk and I do nothing, the cost to me is zero because the probability of something happening was zero. If I do something and there was a risk, then I'm going to assume my cost was zero because I did something to mitigate the cost of the event occurring. However, there's two other costs that factor into this. Now, the one that gets all the press is, what if there was a risk and you did nothing? This is Dick Cheney's proverbial mushroom cloud on the horizon. If we don't do something, there could be a biological attack, nuclear radiological attacks. If we don't do anything, so we have to do something because there's some risk that this is going to happen. The other risk that doesn't get a lot of attention is, what is the cost of doing something when I shouldn't have do done anything at all? And this is the cost associated with making the wrong decision about whether or not someone is a terrorist or some community is a threat. So if you think about it, it's interesting that the one that gets all the attention is the case that says, well, what, what if something is going to happen? But the probability of that is actually really, really small. In the case of considering someone being a convert, like I said, that's about 1 in 10,000, which means the probability that you're wrong in saying if you're a convert, you're a terrorist is almost 1. So you're almost certainly going to be wrong. So you need to consider out what's the negative impact or what's the cost of me misidentifying somebody. So <coughs> I gave this talk two years ago uh, at Safeguarding Australia, which is a big national conference. And at the end of it, um, uh, someone from the press stood up and said, what my, asked me what my point was. And I guess I would say my point glibly was don't do stupid stuff. Uh, but more accurately, there's a couple of points that need to be taken home. When we engage in activities that are looking uh, to counter 
chances of violent radicalization or violent extremism. We should A, if you're gonna do something, you need to build a measure in to see whether or not it was successful. Most public policy is in, as it is enacted has no device to measure whether or not it was su successful. A few years ago, I did a uh, bit of a literature review searching all the literature that was uh, assessing the effectiveness of various counter-radicalization problems. Out of about 130 studies, none of them had actually measured anything. They had a lot of reports and interviews with people who participated on both sides. Uh, and they had anecdotal evidence where people said, well, yeah, I thought I had a pretty good time. I, I seem to think it worked. So most public policy gets enacted without any way of telling whether or not it's actually gonna have a positive effect or a negative effect for that matter. So the first point is if you're gonna do something, have a way of measuring it. The second point is if you're gonna do something, the risk that you need to worry about is not the one where you don't do something and something bad happens. You need to worry about the risk of doing something when there is no threat. And I won't name any names, but certain large police departments have discovered that this is a very big problem. When you go and decide to target an entire ethnic community that you perceive as a threat, and you're gonna wiretap them, you're gonna hang outside their mosques and send undercover agents into the local restaurants to spy on them. Number one, you're always gonna get caught. You know, you're always gonna get caught. It will always come out that you spied on this community. Number two, you've just shot yourself in the foot because now you've made the number one resource you have for assessing threats and getting information about that community distrust you. So now you've taken a group of people who are closed off, well, and you made them even more paranoid and suspicious of the police, even more unwilling to go to the authorities when they think there's something that needs to be said. Um, the British Army learned this in Ireland Sending more troops into Northern Ireland didn't really do much to prevent the IRA from bombing people, but it sure did make a lot of people who maybe weren't inclined one way or the other in the conflict, made them certainly less inclined towards the British side of things. And a lot of research I think has shown, or a lot of the research that John Horgan has done in this area, showed that really it was the, one of the side factors is people being indifferent about it and saying, well, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna participate but I'm not gonna rat anybody out. Um, so if we think about this mathematically, <coughs> why, does this, why does profiling not work? Well, if I use Bayes' theorem to express this, right, I wanna know, essentially, uh, and Bayes' theorem, theorem simply says the probability that event B happens given that event A happens, say for instance, the probability that you're a terrorist given that you're a convert is just equal to the probability you're a convert given that you're a terrorist times the probability you're a terrorist divided by the probability you're a convert. So if we think about this, we want to say, I want to identify some factor that will give me information and change the probability of some event. So for instance, I want to know I know what the probability is somebody's a terrorist. I have an overall average value for that. But what's the information gain that I get out of this? Or how much can I increase that probability? Well, that, it turns out, is, a, is simply a, the ratio, the probability that someone's a terrorist, given, or someone's a convert given a terrorist, divided by the probability they're a convert. So, I'll say this very carefully. <coughs> What that means is for something to be a good predictive factor, it must be utterly ubiquitous in the target group of people. I, it must be something that almost is common to every single terrorist. And it must be almost unheard of in the general population. So it must be something that's very rare in the general population and very common in the target population. And that's a good predictive factor for making predictions about whether or not that other condition exists. The order of magnitude that you're talking about for the difference of those things, when you're talking about the baseline rate of being one in 10,000 or one in 100,000, is huge. Almost to the point where you'd have to have something that was a probably near zero in the general population and near one among terrorists. And unfortunately, as we've seen, when you look at things like behavioral profiling, ethnic backgrounds, gender, 
uh, age, education, nothing sticks out. It's all over the place. And there's certainly nothing that sticks out that isn't common in a normal population. Now, I like to poke fun of profilers a lot. And so I found this copy of the profiler of the BTK killer, Dennis Rader. And I thought, this was great. This was wonderful. This was a criminal profile developed for him. He was a single white male between the ages of 28 and 30. That doesn't narrow it down very much. I would, I would garner that would be quite a few of us in this room, let alone the general population. You know, these things are all very vague sort of conditions. They live in a house, not an apartment. Uh, he's single, not married, which actually turned, to be, uh, turned out to be wrong. Uh, you know, and I love the one down. Oh, by the way, he's a psychopath. Problem is, I don't think he was wearing a T-shirt that said psychopath all the time. This is one of those cases where, yeah, I'm sure he is, but you can't tell it just by looking at him. Okay? Now, like I said, I poke fun at these things, these criminal profiles. But criminal profiles in a criminal investigation get used in a very different way than profiling for terrorists gets used. Okay? In the course of a criminal investigation, something bad has already happened. The profile is a, simply a tool for investigators to help narrow down their list of suspects. It's not a tool for them to go round up everybody that meets this profile and bring them in for eight hours of questioning under the lights. Okay? It's more meant to be a supportive document rather than a condition that they're going to go out and round up and arrest people for meeting this profile, which too often is how the profiles in counterterrorism and counterviolent extremism stuff works. So that's my big policy talk that I don't think I'll ever get invited back to safeguarding Australia for. Um, but that's this case about profiling doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because we can't find anything that's rare in the general population and very common in the population that we're interested in. Okay. It works for this sort of thing, because you're narrowing it down from everybody to at least smaller than everybody. Um, and I think it's not necessarily an unuseful tool, although the criminological literature, there's many, many, many articles debating the validity of profiling in that context as well. Um, but I always loved watching TV where they say, oh, well, he's a, it's a single white man between the age of 25 and 35, and he's got a job, and he drives a car. And I'm thinking, where is the probative value in that at all? But apparently, it, it makes TV shows great. Um, so the second sort of set of work that I'm going to talk about um, is work I've done using data from what's called the Global Terrorism Database. Now, the Global Terrorism Database is a open source database that is open access, free to use for anyone who wants to use it. And it is maintained by a group of researchers at the University of Maryland in the US. And there's a really lovely story about it. Uh, has anyone ever read Dashiell Hammett? Anyone know who Dashiell Hammett is? Sam Spade, Pinkerton Detective Agency. Pinkerton Detective Agency was a very old detective agency in the U.S. It was made particularly famous by Dashiell Ham Hammett, who was a Pinkerton man and was a famous novelist who wrote The Maltese Falcon and other mystery stories in the 20s. But the Pinkerton detective agency evolved into the Pinkerton Global Intelligence Service. And starting in the set in the 1970s, they started collecting incidents of terrorism globally, mainly from wire clippings and things like that. And they had a couple ex-Air Force intelligence officers go through and compile this database. And they did this up until about, I think, 1997. Uh, and the database uh, consisted of shoeboxes filled with note cards. And I think about two, I, get, I think about 2001, Gary LaFree at the University of Maryland, in a stroke of what I can only call genius, figured out that this database was up for sale. And he went and got money from, I think, uh, Department of Homeland Security to buy this thing and computerize it and update it. It's pretty good. There's only one problem. Um, the shoebox for 1993 was missing. So when you go in the database, there's no data for 1993. They have aggregate data for 1993, but they don't have any individual records for that. So <coughs> I just think it's funny. The shoebox went missing. Um, so currently, the, the, the Global Terrorism Database has about 180,000 records 
Um, it covers events from 1970 up until 2017. And I think there's at least 80 covariates on stuff. I think most cases are geotagged, although I would not swear how good the geocoding is on some of the older ones. Um, but it's a pretty interesting database. And when I first started in this area, um, I was sort of brought in to work on a project looking at terrorism in uh, Southeast Asia, particularly Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. And this is one of the first things that I plotted out was to look at at this data. And it's kind of interesting because the first thing I noticed is <coughs> events look like they appear in clusters. There appear to be sort of these dark bands as you see them. This is, this is from 1970 to 2017, so it's very dense. But you can see these sort of dark bands where there's lots of events that occur together. And then there's wide open white spaces where nothing happens. And so there's kind of multiple explanations for why this can occur. Um, one thing we know is that terrorists learn from other terrorists. Um, we know that knowledge gets transferred from terrorist groups to terrorist groups. Um, this could be a transfer of not only information about how to conduct terrorist acts or information about targets. It could be supplies, material. It could be simply the encouragement to do something, which is this idea of contagion or the idea that if someone sees a terrorist act, it encourages them to go commit one. It's a bit of a simplistic model for now, but we'll talk about it in more details here. So when I looked at this, the first thing I remembered was that a colleague of mine had worked with what are called Hox process models. And this is a set of mathematical models for a Poisson point process. And it describes, it can describe anyway, the rate of events in fixed uniform time periods. And it has this property where it models the rate of those events over time, but it looks at event history and where events have occurred, there's an increase in the rate immediately after. And then that rate decays and decreases over time. Uh, these are called, like I said, they're called a Hox process or sometimes they're called a self-exciting process. And this is sort of a graphical representation. You can sort of see how this works. You have a rate, it jumps up, and then it sort of starts decaying. It jumps up, it starts decaying, and it, it goes back, hopefully, we think, to some stationary level. So these models were actually uh, developed in the early 70s, I think 1970-71. Hawks wrote two papers on these. And in one of the papers, I, I love this, he just sort of randomly spits out, oh, by the way, this is good for modeling uh, uh, hijackings. No justification, no reasoning, other than he seemed to think it was well understood that hijackings were a contagious process. Um, a few years after that, there was a bit of a refinement, not really not much of a refinement, but sort of a reinterpretation of the model and an understanding of what it could also describe. And it could also describe what's called a cluster process. And this says that there's essentially two, two Poisson processes going on in a situation. There is a, I think they said typically constant, baseline rate of events, okay? And these, that rate of events is not affected by the occurrence or non-occurrence of any other events. The second process is the self-exciting process. And the self-exciting process, so events that are attributed to the self-exciting process are events that are caused by events from sort of that parent or baseline process. So mathematically, we say this is a convolution of two Poisson processes. Um, and I, I hope this picture would kind of explain it. It sort of shows this idea of branching uh, and children and this idea of parent and children events. Which brings me to the concepts of diffusion and contagion as applied to terrorism. So uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Midlarsky um, and actually it wasn't, I don't think it was a 1980 paper, it was actually in the mid-70s. He was trained as a physicist uh, and later began a lot of work on political science and particularly he was one of the many scholars in the 70s who was very interested in understanding uh, political violence uh, in all kinds of contexts. There were a lot of papers written on coups, there were papers written on uh, this one in particular that Midlarsky did was looking at the occurrence of riots in major American cities during the 60s. And Midlarsky being a physicist, the first model he tried to fit was based on a diffusion process. 
And he found that that alone wasn't explaining all the variation in the data he was seeing. And he sort of intuited and, and figured out that there were actually two of these processes going on. Uh, there were two mechanisms for how violence was spreading and how riots were occurring, basically. One of them was this idea of contagiousness. And behavioral contagion is a bit of a... There's a lot of discussion around what it means and how it's actually defined. And it's, it's, but it's basically the concept that if I see you do something that ordinarily I wouldn't do, okay, such as throw a brick through a window and steal a television set, if I see you do that and then I see you get some benefit, i.e. the television set, I am likely to copy that behavior. Okay? So it's the notion of people, you observe behavior outside of your normal behavioral patterns, you perceive a benefit, you see yourself in the same situation as that individual, and you're inclined to mimic that, that action. So this was this idea of how riots spread. Um, there are different models in the, in the group of crowds. In the, there's a whole field of crowd studies now. And this one, I think, contagion is not quite as popular as it once was for describing riots. Um, although, uh, there was a paper in the Journal of Mathematical Sociology a few years ago that actually applied this model to uh, the London riots um, of a few years ago. The other mechanism that Midlarsky talked about was the concept of diffusion. And that was the concept that people would actually spontaneously act based on external stimuli. A common example is the police do something and upset people and a riot breaks out. Okay? That's not a contagious event. That's an event that's caused by some external force. And so he called that a diffusion process. So if we think about this in the context of that cluster process, description of the Hawk self-exciting model, the self-exciting part well describes contagion, and the diffusion process can describe this whole idea of external events influencing the rate of events. Okay? So if we apply this to terrorism, we sort of think about the idea of essentially we look at contagious processes. They have a very short time frame for variation, um, whereas a diffusion process might have rates that vary only slowly over long-term periods. Contagion, you'll see the contagion effects last a few days, typically, from an event. Diffusion effects can be things that are substantial. Uh, and typically, we enforce stationarity on the contagious process, or it tends to follow. Whereas, actually, the diffusion process isn't necessarily stationary in the sense that the uh, expectation is, is uh, time invariant. So I work with a class of these models, which are based on actually a convolution between the negative binomial contagion process and a Poisson process describing diffusion. Uh, they tend to be very computationally difficult to work with or evaluate uh, in a statistical sense because they end up being a mixed effects model. So there's identifiability issues. Uh, and they are expensive to compute, period. But they do produce some kind of interesting results, OK? So one of the cases I looked at was, um, and this is just the data from Afghanistan from 2000 to 2017. And any eagle-eyed viewer might look at that one event that's a huge spike that shoots up. Uh, I was a little worried about this, so I actually looked this up. This was actually uh, September 18th, 2010. Uh, it was parliamentary elections in Afghanistan, and if you go read the papers, there were many, many attacks on polling stations and police stations. Um, so there's about 57 events recorded uh, in the global terrorism database for that day. So that one's actually pretty legitimate. Um, so what we did is we took this data and we fit this model that sort of splits things between contagion and diffusion. And for the diffusion rate, we fit what was called um, a spline which basically tries to paint a smooth curve over the data. But to that, we added essentially what were step functions for various events that we thought might be important or have influenced this rate. And in particular, what we looked at uh, was just sort of a wide set of events. And you can see here where there's sort of some little breaks in the lines where those steps are occurring. And it turns out none of these are particularly significant. Um, 
if anything, what you really see is around the time that security responsibility starts being transferred to Afghan forces, you really see things ratcheting up quite a bit. One of the other things we looked at uh, in this paper that's a work in progress was we looked at what kind of factors would influence the contagiousness of an event. Okay? And after some exploratory data analysis, what we found is one of the few things that appeared to be relatively significant was looking at the number of people killed or the number of fatalities for an event. Okay? Now, there's a couple things about that. There's a thought that very large-scale fatality events, in fact, turn to, tend to turn people away. They tend to be a disincentive for people. They create a lot of public distrust and, and anger. Um, the other argument is that if it's a large fatality event, it was also an event that took a lot of resources. And so if you're a terrorist group, you operate with limited material resources. Uh, so if you go and you do some very large event, you're less likely to be able to do something after that. Um, so we looked at that, and we get this result, this function, which is a, a little bit unexciting. But it is simply on the y-axis, this is sort of the degree of contagiousness, if you will. And on the x-axis, it's a log scale for the number of fatalities in an event. And what we really see in Afghanistan, it appears to be a slightly decreasing function, but not substantially so. In all likelihood, that's really just a constant. Okay, it's, it's really not much effect due to that. There's a couple possible reasons for that. One of the reasons is that if you look in Afghanistan, most of the events that are terrorist events are actually attributed to the Taliban, which was a very, I'll say relatively large, well-organized organization that had a pretty big capacity for doing things. Um, and in fact, Afghanistan is actually not so much of uh, a terrorist conflict in the sense that some people describe it, particularly to me in reviews, uh, but it's a bit of an insurgency, really. Now, Iraq was a bit of a different story. Um, in Iraq, we still see some pretty crazy patterns in the data. But when we went and looked at a series of events kind of centered around both the surge um, and some sort of key events in, in, in the rise of ISIS, we get a much different picture. Now, what's interesting is about that third dot from the left uh, is the first bombing of the al Aqsari Mosque. And this was the event that got everyone in Washington, D.C. screaming for a surge. And you'll see that there's actually a pretty significant drop at that point in the rate of events. And then the next dot, that fourth dot in, is actually when the troop surge was announced. And in fact, there's a bit of a step up. None of these, I don't think, are particularly significant, statistically speaking. Uh, in fact, none of these, I think, are really statistically significant until you get to the point where it says US troop withdrawal complete. And there's a pretty precipitous drop. Um, and then it really ramps up, and again, at the point ISIL captures, ISIS captures, captures Mosul, again, there's a pretty precipitous drop in events. Okay. Looking at how the number of fatalities affects the contagiousness of events for Iraq, first thing we see that's kind of interesting is for one thing, uh, the highest value this gets is awfully close to one. And any value over one is deemed to be an explosive process because it means that each event, that, that number is essentially the expected number of children from each event. So if the expected number is greater than one, it's like a chain reaction, we think. So on the low end of the scale in Iraq, that's near one. The other thing is, it is most likely that there is a significant relationship in Iraq where as the number of fatalities increase, the degree of contagiousness or the expected number of child events, if you will, decreases over time or over the number of fatalities. And that's a little bit interesting because then if you go into Iraq and you look at group attribution for all these events, what you see is that um, in Iraq, there's just a lot of little groups doing things. There's not any one large unifying force 
uh, conducting terrorist operations. In fact, we know that this was basically degenerated into sectarian violence uh, in the early part of the 21st century. And there were lots of groups vying for power. So we know that, that actually narrative sort of carries out. All right, so quickly, what do we do from here? Um, I've got some nice math models that seem to tell us some things about terrorism. That's all well and good. Um, but just in general, you know, we've been conditioned over the past 10, 15 years to think about terrorism in a very specific way at a very specific geographical location conducted by very specific people. The problem with counterterrorism is the problem with any kind of military endeavor that they run into, which is you're always fighting the last war. Uh, in this case, we're geared towards a threat that is probably, I won't say on the wane, but we're certainly facing some larger threats as well that need to be paid attention to. Um, the first one is the rise of far-right ideologies and the far-rightist terrorism. Um, if you look, and, and I also mentioned envi both environmental terrorism and the effects of climate change on terrorism. In fact, arguably, far-right terrorism is being driven by environmental change. Um, as the environment changes, as climate changes, people are moving, and they're forced to move other places to find work and food and water. And when large populations move into places where there are, are already large populations, things don't typically go well. Um, interestingly enough, the Global Terrorism Database records 73 terrorist events in Australia between 1970 and 2017. 32 of those have been in the last five years. And a surprising number of them have been in Toowoomba. Christchurch was in New Zealand, but the individual involved there was actually radicalized in Australia. So this is an Australian problem. It's, it's not other people's problems. Which brings us to the hard part of all of this. There has been some research into hate crimes and hate groups and understanding far right ideology. We need to do more. Um, in particular, uh, we need to do, uh, we need to play catch up a little bit, I think. Um, overall, data literacy in general for qualitative researchers should be improved. I say that also, Quantitative researchers need to be better educated about how qualitative research works. And they need to understand more of the nuances of phenomena rather than trying to simply reduce it to a simple model. It would be nice to get younger mathematicians, statisticians, computer science, data experts interested in working in this field. Um, there's a lot of benefit they can bring uh, despite the difficulties in, in those things. I, I like to think they're going to get better over time. I think the field is recognizing more and more the value of quantitative research and the need for it. And another thing is we need to try and maintain and improve communication between the government and academia. Uh, working in any intelligence area in academia and trying to work with the government can seem like having a conversation with an echo many times. Uh, but we need to keep it up. Um, it's a useful thing to do. All right, that is my talk. Um, I would actually like to thank Dr. Kate Irwin for her assistance in preparing all these slides. She was invaluable at providing many of these references. Um, thanks for your time and attention. And do you have any questions? And if you're interested, I have many of the sources that I've referred to, even though I did not cite them explicitly in my text, um, many of the sources where this work was drawn from. All right, that's it. Thank you.